We all love Zelda music. It's arguably the most important musical legacy in gaming, and while each new entry in the series always has plenty of its own musical ideas to offer, they all also contribute to the tradition of Zelda music, taking from this shared pool of themes and developing them in new ways decades after they were originally introduced. The way Zelda games keep building on this tradition year after year has led to something so much more profound than the sum of its parts. And that's why this week, the 30th anniversary of its North American release, I want to celebrate the Big Kahuna, the granddaddy of all Zelda music, the game that started it all, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. Okay, I guess the original Legend of Zelda started it all, but that's more like the series' great-grandfather that you still visit, but you don't really understand anything he says. And then Zelda 2 is like the great-uncle that you're not convinced is actually related to you. Uh, sorry, what I meant to say is that while the original Zelda gave us the main Zelda theme, which is certainly nothing to balk at, A Link to the Past gave us basically every other musical idea that we associate with the series today. It cemented Zelda and Ganon's themes, the Master Sword fanfare, the Fairy Fountain music, and more, as well as the piece that I want to dissect today, the Hyrule Castle theme. It might not be quite as universally known as Zelda's theme or the Fairy Fountain theme, but it's a surprisingly deep piece of music that can teach us a lot about the craftsmanship of composition. So strap on your nostalgia goggles and let's storm this castle. First, let's take a zoomed out look at the piece in its entirety before we get into the nitty gritty details. We start with a short intro fanfare to set the stage, as Koji Kondo so often does. Then we move into a little vamp setting up the groove and the key of the piece. And then we get three distinct sections which I'll be calling A, B, and C. The end of the C section brings back the same vamp from the intro to set up a repeat back to the start of the A section for the piece to loop. What I want to draw your attention to as we analyze this piece is how every single note is placed with significance. Every musical idea either develops an idea that came before, or foreshadows an idea to come later, or both. Take the intro. It's big. It's daunting. It sets the mood for the majestic yet intimidating Hyrule Castle beautifully. But more than that, it puts forward three musical ideas. The brass chords here are stacked in perfect fourth intervals, getting a perfect blend of regal and bleak, and they move harmonically from the one chord, G minor, or really a G stack of fourths, to the flat two, an A flat stack of fourths, and then back to our G. Moving between the one chord and the flat two chords adds a darkness to the music. Even in two dimensions, you can feel how daunting it is to have the castle walls towering above you. This feeling gets carried into the introductory groove that follows as the brass once again harmonize in perfect fourths. These staccato syncopated brass rhythms contrast the long-held notes of the low string line that enters, but they both put forward the same harmonic idea. We outline a move from G minor to F back to G minor, and then we get the flat 2, A flat, going down to the raised 7th, F sharp, which resolves back to our tonic G minor. This is what we call a double chromatic enclosure, and it's one of the main musical ideas that we see developed through the theme. The idea of using the flat 2 in the key of G minor was foreshadowed by the intro fanfare, but this double chromatic enclosure figure takes that idea even farther by mirroring the chromatic movement below our G note as well as above. This figure continues through the A section as the strings bring in the melody on top, giving us a simple 3 bar figure. It's a strong statement, one that you undoubtedly have ingrained in your brain already if you've played almost any Zelda games, but it's also a great melodic interpretation of the ideas that we've already had introduced. Starting with a leap down of a fourth from G to D is a strong melodic move which fits with the regal nature of the setting, but it also references the fourth voicings found in the brass section. And the following scalar figure sees us running up from a G to an A flat to a B flat before dipping down to an F sharp and then ending the whole phrase on a G, showcasing the same double chromatic enclosure idea we saw in the harmony in a melodic way. 
This phrase effortlessly captures the core identity of the piece, or rather, everything we've heard up until this point was foreshadowing the ideas contained in this melody. The melody repeats four times with a bare minimum amount of change, moving from the one chord to the four chord and back in an A-A-B-A -A -A pattern. And though this structure's simple, it comes across as clarity because the main melodic statement is so strong. The B section brings in some contrast to the syncopated brass groove with some triplet rhythms that open up the music. Trading back and forth between triplet rhythms and straight eighth notes creates this really cool rhythmic tension between the two subdivisions, an idea we hear especially clearly in the brass interjections that shift from 32nd notes to 16th notes to 8th notes to triplets all in the same phrase. This interplay between straight eighth and triplet rhythms is part of the DNA of heroic Zelda music going all the way back to the original game, but it was also foreshadowed really subtly in the A section previous. If you'll recall, the A section melody runs up in eighth notes and then resolves back to our tonic with this triplet figure, bouncing between B flat and F sharp notes. It's subtle enough that you wouldn't exactly think of it as a core idea of the piece, listening to just this section, but when it gets developed further as a primary part of the following B section, the A section retroactively is given more meaning. There's more here too. The harmony is flipped around from what we've heard previously, with the B section starting on our flat 2 chord and then resolving down to our tonic G after. The melody again starts off by outlining the interval of a descending perfect fourth, but this time it's a little bit hidden, filled in with a walk down the scale to get there. This is part of what makes a piece of music deep. It's all the same ideas being played with between these two sections, but it's like the ideas that were in the foreground before are pushed to the back now, and the ideas that were hiding in the background before are brought out into the spotlight. These two sections are the perfect complement to each other. But it's not over yet. After the B section, we get a C section. This is unusual for this era of game music where most pieces use just two looping sections, but like everything else in this tune, this third section was put here for a purpose. If the purpose of B sections in music, in general and in this example, are to contrast the ideas of the A section, then this C section's purpose is to flesh out and tie together all of the ideas we've been presented with so far in a big climactic finish. First, Kondo brings the energy down. We take the idea of our triplet and straight eighth rhythmic clash and create a string groove around it, outlining a G minor to A7 to F sharp diminished to G minor progression. The melody played in the low strings is new, yet feels somehow familiar. This melody isn't an obvious development of any single idea that's come before, but I think it is elaborating on the original A section melody, or specifically, this figure from that melody. You could split this bar up into two halves, the scalar walk up from G to B flat, and then the resolution back with this F sharp B flat G movement. You wouldn't normally think of this as being in two distinct halves, because each half is so short on its own, and they flow seamlessly together. But if we stretched both of these general ideas out, you could get something that looks like our C section melody, a scalar figure starting on our tonic G and moving upward, and then moving back and forth in thirds that outline the underlying chord changes, and ending up with this same B flat to F sharp to B flat to G resolution. It's this last melodic resolution that has me convinced I'm not making too big of a leap here.
The melody repeats, this time doubled up in a high flute part to build a little bit of tension before the brass come roaring in for another new melody. At this point, it's like, how many melodies are going to be in this tune? And if each melody had nothing to do with each other, the piece would surely sound all over the place. But it doesn't sound all over the place. It sounds like a cohesive, climactic culmination of everything we've heard so far, even if you don't consciously hear the musical connections taking place. While the first half of the C section was arguably a development of the A section melody, the second half is arguably a development of the B section. The main motif here is a held note on beat one, followed by two quicker notes leading into an upward moving eighth note figure that resolves into a held whole note. This whole phrase is then structured like so. It repeats once as is, then the first bar is taken and the whole contour moves up by step for three bars before resolving finally to one last whole note to end the phrase. This last C section melody starts on a held note on beat one, followed by two quicker notes that lead into a downward moving eighth note figure that resolves to a held whole note. This phrase is repeated down a chord tone from the first bar, and then the first bar is taken and moves in sequence downward for three bars before resolving finally to one last held whole note. Listen to both back to back and see if you can hear the structural similarities. It's not so similar in contour that you would immediately notice what's going on, but this part is a rough inversion of the B section melody, moving down where the other moves up, and vice versa, and the rhythm and structure are what really give it away. Also, the fact that we jump up from a G minor phrase before this to start on C minor here is a clear reference to the harmonic structure of our A section. It all feels so familiar, but it's put together so subtly that we don't realize why this climax feels so satisfying. I think this piece is an example of the highest level of craftsmanship that Koji Kondo displays in his work. The simplicity and clarity of each melodic idea, the elegance of the structure, the interconnectedness of all the different moving parts, and, above all, the way it comes together to create a mood that paints your whole perception of the 16-bit castle environment. This is Kondo firing on all cylinders. I hope these observations riled you up as much as they riled me up when I noticed them. And in celebration of the game's 30th anniversary, I'm uploading my full score transcriptions of the entire game's soundtrack for you all to enjoy in the link in the description. If you enjoy my work here and want to support the channel, please consider checking out my Patreon. Thanks so much for watching the video and I'll see you all in the next one.